All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, again, the normal scenario, confusion, confusion, confusion. Um, but it's all right. So here is our brother David, who would like to open us up in prayer. Um, that maybe things will not be so confusing. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is great to be in your presence and to hear the word of God. I pray that all is well. And I, and I really pray about uh, the one scripture that says, God did not give us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And I pray that no, what anyone is going through, it says what is impossible for man is uh, possible for God. We have to understand that, uh, you know, God can do anything. But it doesn't mean that he will do anything. So uh, what I'm learning is I have to learn how to persevere through things. You know, things oh, that, yes. A lot of times things just don't change the way that I want them to. And like it says, uh, you know, don't worry. But seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And it also says, you know, don't worry about tomorrow because problems of its own. And that's what I really pray for. You know, the worrying. What's going to happen? You know, why is this happening? And I just want to learn how to live and to enjoy life. And to really have that strong relationship with Jesus, not just a belief in Jesus. To walk up to another individual and say, hey, bro, brother and sister, do you, do you know Jesus? You know? Because, uh, you know, the, if I'm not careful, you know, the cares of, of this world can get too big. Uh, which I have done before, and, uh, it, it, you know, it, it'll, pu it'll push God out, uh, and I'll be like... Oh, I have to do this and I realize that's never a good thing when I say I have to I have to because if you have to do everything then you reach the point of you can become overwhelmed and uh, that's never a great feeling and uh, unfortunately um, this might be the last time you might hear me uh, you know pray for a whole while but you know we're always together in spirit mm -hmm. and I just pray that uh, your, your relationship with God and mine will grow and that um, you have a blessed life Amen, Amen. thank you yeah all right um, yeah we're um, as he mentioned, um, this might be the last time he's praying. We're going to kind of probably take a break from Facebook, from the social media aspect a about this. Uh, we're probably going to be taking a, a break from my in-depth study of Scripture, line by line, verse by verse. But we're going to continue our little fellowship of breaking bread and studying the Bible. I've already mentioned this to them, uh, and I, but I didn't do it. So what we'll do is you guys must bring, must, your own Bible. Because we're going to be opening the picture and, and you underline your own Bible. And if you use it electronically that thing but uh, we won't be looking on the TV for that unless we're like studying scripture like going through blue letter so at any rate we're just going to be uh, take a break for a, a small period of time hopefully not too long and um, then we'll get back into this in-depth Bible study verse by verse chapter by chapter or chapter by ch book by book chapter by chapter verse by verse 
Uh, that being said, let's get what we have done, even though I have not put a conclusion on it. Uh, obviously, this is here if you guys want to send and support. Uh, but again, we're going to be off for a little while. So, anyway, let me just move on. Before I start crying. Okay, so w those of us that do want to look in the book or look on the screen, we're in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 10. And we are uh, going to read verses 2 through 4. Let me need to make sure my microphone is working it is working thank you amanda okay so last week we were in the book of revelation and we were studying verse one we spent the whole hour hour and 14 minutes on verse one now we're going to do probably the same amount of time for verses two through four so, does somebody want to read this, or do you want me to read this? I'll let you read it. Okay. She's the only one that voiced. Um, Revelation chapter 10, verses 2 through 4 says, And he had in his hand a little book. He is the angel, the mighty angel. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up those things which the seven thunders utter and write them not. Okay, so when most of us read, we just kind of read things over and we don't really meditate on it. But the first things I want you to meditate on is taking in context of verse 1, um, where there's this another mighty angel. That this is mighty, is big, man of valor, more important, okay? Um, he has in his hand a book, and the book's open. Point one to register. Point two is his right foot's on the sea and his left foot on the earth. Now I don't know about you, but when you read that, I'm reading, how can that be? What does that mean? His, his foot, his right foot is actually being supported by the sea? Or is his right foot sunk down to the ocean floor, which is still the earth, and his left foot's on the earth as he's <clears throat> sideways does he have one leg bent up? These things, like, I'm reading it, and it's like, wait a minute, there's got to be an explanation for this. And then he, he cried with a loud voice. So the angel cried with a loud voice. How many times have I told you before that when God talks to you, he talks to you with a loud voice? Where the church will tell you, well, God talks to you that small, quiet voice in. Well, God did at one time, and it's mentioned one time, one time only, that God spoke to a man in a small voice. Mm -hmm. And that was with the story of Elijah. But when God talks to you, he talks to you in ability so that you can hear. If you're going, if you're a follower of God and you're going to run into some devastation, is God going to say, And then you turn that way and you die. Or is he going to say it as loud or as necessary to get your attention? Can you say that? Yeah, as yeah, necessary, right? It might be at the top of his lungs if he had lungs, or it might not. But I guarantee you, if you're a mother here and your kid runs out into the street and you see his car running down, you're going to be screaming at the top of your lungs, running out there as fast as you can to grab that little kid to quit doing what it's not supposed to do. So this angel, we notice that, cries with a loud voice. And then there's seven thunders. Not that this, this loud voice sounded like seven thunders, 
seven thunders uttered their voices. And These thunders have voices. And yes. What did you look up what thunders are? Well, we'll get to that later. This is what I'm trying to say is why it takes so long because there's all these points that most people just overlook. Mm -hmm. And then John's about to write. What was he going to write on? He's having a vision. Did the angel give him that book that no. was open? Is John writing in that book? Does, was the angel giving him something else to write on? What was he writing on? And what was he writing with? Where'd he get the tablet? You know, these are all things that one must think. Is why it takes so long because we want, we want to have a sure foundation. I do not want anybody that I preach to to be able to say to, to God or Satan or anybody, he, he, he didn't explain the scripture right. Okay? So let's get into our study now. You can't, can, I put this out like, man, the little book. So I want to ask you, can you keep a secret? I know in my own life, secrets are sometimes hard to keep. Here, John is told in his vision to keep a secret, which has been kept for 2,000 years. Pause. Does anyone know up to date what was in that little book? No. What the seven thunders? Are? So no. that secret has been kept pretty good, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I wish the people I talked to and told secrets could keep their secrets that long, right? Mm -hmm. It's always like sometimes you, you you say something to somebody in confidence and then a year later or so you hear from somebody else, well, you did this, you said that, and it's like, well, how do you know that? Oh, well, so-and-so mm -hmm. told me. And I said, well, wait a minute. I told them that in confidence, mm -hmm. okay? It's hard to keep a secret. I get people to, when I... Uh, minister to other people especially when I was doing it when we had a large group of people that we were doing from the jail and the rehabs and and uh, things like that people would tell me all kinds of things that I had to keep secret mm -hmm. including crimes mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. confidentiality what you tell me as a pastor in private I cannot divulge unless it involves a capital crime such as uh, we won't go by that there are exceptions okay so if you tell me you killed somebody you're going to jail I'll have to tell them right okay so this little book oh I'm sorry therefore I doubt because this secret has been kept for 2,000 years I doubt there's anything we can learn about what was written in that book if it was any value to us, do you think, I think God would uh, have revealed it to us? Does God want this great mystery held that's going to keep you from obtaining salvation? Is it going to keep you from uh, keeping your salvation? Is it going to keep, uh, keep you from obtaining the power and the victory that God has on his life? If so, God's not a good God. So there's nothing in this book that really pertains to us now. But there will be. It will. Otherwise, God wouldn't have showed it to him. Okay? Um, so, rather, I think we must understand the significance of the mighty angel, where he stands, and the thundering voices John heard. Remember that verse talked about that? So why is he standing on the, why is it a mighty angel? And that, is this angel great big like the movies Megatron? Mm -hmm. You know, is he 20 stories tall? Or is he six foot, five foot tall? You know, mm -hmm. and standing on a seashore, one foot in the water, one foot on the seashore, right? Uh, these things all we were going to study. So this little book the angel is holding is open. Now, what do you, what's it mean a lot? Okay, let me finish reading. Which suggests all that it is in it can be read or it is still being written. So when you say the book is closed, the case is closed, nothing can be added to or taken away from it, right? Mm -hmm. 
But when the investigation is open, when the book is open, it's not talking about like this Bible is open so you can read. It's it's open and still being written. There's still new books being written into this book. So there's two ways of looking at that statement. Um, some have suggested the title deed that this book is what was written in this book have, is the title deed to earth and Christ's right, right to rule over it using both Jeremiah and or Jeremiah 32 and Psalms uh, chapter 2. Okay, now I say most. Who's most? Have you ever heard anybody say that? No, maybe not. But if you look in, if you happen to own a Bible with commentaries on it, I have a lot of Bibles, a lot of different commentaries, a lot of different study. Mm -hmm. No, almost all of them say that. Okay, that this what's written in this book is the title deed. I want to show you that that's not a possibility. That has to be something else. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 10 and Psalms 2 verses 6 through 9. This is what Jeremiah says, 32, 10 through 11. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witness and weighed him the money in the balance. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and customs, which was upon, open to it. This is not saying that Jesus has the title deed. They're really stretching it out. You'd have to really read this in, in context. Uh, Jesus already has the title deed. Jesus already has been revealed. It's not something that's going forward in the future. It's something that happens right now. Psalms tells us, Yet I have set my kingdom upon the holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So if God is going to give Jesus the heretic, uh, the Gentiles, you and me, has he already done that? Are you a Christian? Yes. Are you in Christ Jesus? Come on, everybody say it. I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm the inheritance of Jesus. Romans says if you're children of God, you're heirs of God, you're joint heirs with Christ Jesus, if indeed you suffer with it. Is this still going to be a future event that was written in a book that, has a, that John can't talk? Or does it already happen? So, it, the secret's out then, right? <laughs> so it can't be a title deed. I'm sorry, scholars sometimes need to pray to the Holy Spirit what the definition is. It is more likely this passage is found in Ezekiel chapter 2, uh, 9 through uh, chapter 2 verse 9 through chapter 3 verse 3 so it's like in this Ezekiel chapter 2 9 and 10 and when I looked and behold I, a hand was sent unto me and lo a roll of a book was therein and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written wherein lamentations and mournings and woe. So Ezekiel says this scroll was so much information that I had to write it on both sides. We all know what a scroll is, right? So it's like our, our, our study notes I give you. Sometimes it's one piece of paper, right? Yeah. And sometimes I write on both sides, front yeah. and back. Okay, because there's so much information. Yeah. Okay, so there's so much information here that Ezekiel has a book that writes on both sides. 
but verse thir- chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 says moreover he said unto me son of man eat what thou findest eat this roll and go and speak to the house of Israel so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the roll and he said unto me son of man cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee then I eat it and it was in my mouth as sweet or honey for as honey for sweetness so this same type of scroll that Ezekiel was told to eat commanded to eat and then go preach tasted sweet like honey this is more likely what it was because that's what John is told to do eat this book and he says it will be sweet in their mouth and bitter in your tummy or bowels so this is why I say this is more likely the situation and what is the situation you're going to take what's written in that book and then you're gonna go prophesy or talk to other people not about what was written but you're going to do it to write on both sides maybe this is to bring you into salvation. How many people know, uh, I mean here, most of us believe in the rapture, right? Mm -hmm. People say the rapture, watch for these signs when the rapture is about to come. You know in the Word of God there's only one sign I know of that says when the rapture will come and I guarantee you it will not come one second before this event happens. Mm -hmm that the persons whose name was the last oh, person's spirit. name whose who, whose name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life has the chance to accept Jesus or reject him. After that, God cannot cause the rapture to come and his wrath come out if there's one Christian on the earth or if there's one person who hasn't had the chance to follow him or reject him. Now there might be other things. You mentioned the moon and all the and, and these other, but that's kind of kind of vague. That's not like a straight point. The straight point is God is long suffering so that all will be saved. Well, how's all? God's desire is all. All those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. His desire is they all be saved. Well, if he's going to cut it off when 50% of them haven't been born yet, that's not a very godly action. Okay? So, John and Ezekiel have both been commanded to go prophesy to other nations, other people, the house of Israel. Who's the house of Israel? This is not replacement theology. Paul says, Christians those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is the house of Israel whether you're Hindu I mean whether you're Polynesian Norwegian Native American Indian you know German whatever nationality you are you're the house of Israel if you're in Christ Jesus Who's a Jew? Not one who is circumcised outwardly, but one who is circumcised inwardly. He is a true Jew. So no, this is not replacement theology. Why did I say that? I just watched a video (laughs) about this guy talking about replacement theology. That it's a bad. Okay, so it is more likely, or I believe, this similarities of these two is found in Ezekiel, telling the prophet Ezekiel not to be afraid of the followers of demons, but eat the book the Lord commanded him to. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. How many of you picked up the Bible and read and then go talk to somebody about God? That's what we need to do. How many of you got a word from God and then go and talk to somebody about God? 
many of us do. Some of us is in a simple little way. You go to a laundromat, you go to work on someone's car, you see them, hell, you help them clean their house, you, you do something like that and you get to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation mm -hmm. and you show the love of God. Well, where'd you get the love of God? From the Bible, from working. She said it, I'm repeating it. Mm -hmm. You gotta know what his character is. You gotta read it, you gotta mm -hmm. do it, and, and, and then go out and do it. You gotta speak to other people. Thus, John is commanded to go eat this little book as well, that the key things written in it might be part of him, whether good or bad. Now when I tell, I, I, I write these things and I study these things, I give you study notes. Why? So it becomes part of you. You don't have to ask me to come do the something and explain it. You could read it and it becomes part of you and now you can share it to other people. Yeah, God's good all the time. He didn't do that. That sickness, that disease, those trials, that lo job loss, that car breaking down, that whatever devastation, it didn't come from God. It came from Satan. God is good all the time to his inheritance. You can't say that if it's not part of you. Because somebody will say, well, how, how about this? How about all these kids being uh, killed in third world countries? How about sex slave, you know, the sex trade? How about, where's God during that? God is good all the time to his inheritance. Well, how about the people begging for food? God, I've not yet seen the righteous beg for food. How come I got food and other people don't? God has not seen the righteous forsaken. God has not seen the righteous beg for food. You might be hungry, like Paul, but guess what? Somebody came and gave you food, like happened to Paul. You might need money, guess what? But someone came and gave you money. You might need to buy a part, guess what? Somebody gave you money to buy the part. You're not devastated as others. We see but we serve a God who supplies our every need. Revelation chapter 10 verse 11 tells us, And he said unto them, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Why have I brought this up? We're not in verse 11. But I just want to tell you that John is commanded to eat this book, then go prophesy. He's not commanded to prophesy, then eat the book. He's commanded to eat the book. Well, what good's eating a book going to do if you can't share what's in it? Because yeah. he wants it to be part of you. You know, James says you have works. Works are great. You show me your faith by my works, and I'll show you, uh, you. You show me your faith by your works, and I'll show you my faith with my works. Right? It's part of you. Is how do I know you have the love of God in you? Because you could quote it, yeah, or because out. what's in you? What comes out? You see the love of God. The book, the Bible, the Holy Word of God, and this Bible has to be so much part of you that people see it in you. <laughs> now additionally, the revelation that Jesus is our Christ who redeemed us from sin has already been revealed. So this is another reason why it's not the title deed. Therefore, it cannot be a title deed. Nor will Jesus return to the earth before tribulation is over, as this angel is seen placing his foot upon the sea and the earth. So this angel, this mighty angel, as we talked last week, cannot be Jesus. And this book cannot be the title deed. But many theologians say those exact things. Revelation chapter 2, which we've already read, and verse 8, which we haven't. 
And he had in his hand a book open, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. So this isn't Jesus, because Jesus hasn't come back until after the tribulation. So it's a mighty angel, another mighty angel, and he puts his foot on the sea and the earth. And the voices which I heard, John, from heaven spoke, spake unto me again, meaning second time at least, mm -hmm. and said, go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. So the angel that's holding the book doesn't say, here, take it. Another voice says, here, take it. Again, uh, yes. Sounds like he's being told or given an identification of where to find the little book. And, you know, the angel that says. Well, it says it's in his hand. Yeah, but in the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. So he knows which angel to go to. So that you're right, that yeah, yeah, sure, there sure. Are many angels. So there's so there's not like ten different books to pick from. Yeah, there's this right. book he's it's showing so you, this book. He's giving identification to the angel on which angel it is. Right. Very good very good op observation. Now since this book's context is not revealed by any prophet or other than John, it was revealed to John, right? But it hasn't been revealed by any other prophet other than John. It is of no value to us to elaborate on as to what is in it. As mentioned before, a lesson might be learned from John's eating the book, making the context real to him. Maybe Jesus is telling us to do the same thing when he said he is the word and the bread of life. I'm not saying that this is what Revelation is saying, but I'm saying there's such a similarity. I'm telling you, Jesus is the word and eat it. Let it become life to you. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Six, chapter 6 of John, verse 35 says, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Wow, does that mean that this Jesus is the bread? You take this bread, you're never going to be hungry again? Or does it mean you'll never hunger, meaning when you are hungry, you all know what's in the book to, and not have to beg for food, but command your refrigerator to be filled with food. You know, the, we used to do a lot of food giveaway, and there was these times we would give up, Des would make grocery bags full of food, essentials, especially during the holidays. So it might have a Christmas theme, an Easter theme, a Thanksgiving theme, but sometimes just periodically, hey, just some staples, just what you did. And we'd make these brown paper bags, this was before we had those plastic ones, brown paper bags, right? And she would put in there one to two bags, right? Family, family with kids, right? Kids would have kid cereal and stuff, right? Who did we give them to? We drove, drove around at night, knocked on people's door and said, the Lord told me to give this to you. And you know how many stories, how many times we had, you know what? I haven't had a thing. It's nine o'clock at night, you came in, and my kids haven't even eaten yet. We haven't eaten all day. And they had that. And they just, thank God. Did they come to God? No, not to my knowledge but were to give to the poor. Did I continually do that? No, but I got their attention. God will get your attention. He has put you in specific places and times in hopes you will grope out after him. He's brought people in your life in hopes that you will see the love of God. Yeah. He didn't give you the torment. He didn't give you the bad situation. That was Satan. But he brought people alongside you who know the book, 
who could get you out of that bad situation. So, um, as I mentioned earlier in previous studies, the mighty angel was upon the earth and was so big that he was able to put one foot on the sea and the other on the land. Yet there seems to be more significance to this statement than the size of this being. Here are some similarities of sea, seashore, and walking on the sea you might consider or for your consideration. We know Jesus walks, I don't have supporting scripture, we can find them, but uh, most of you know this. Jesus walks on the seashore, seashore, and calls the fishermen who were in the sea to come and follow him. Remember when Jesus comes to and gets some of his disciples, they were fishing and he says, cast your net on the other side. And they go, but hey man, we've, we've, we've been fishing all night. But at your request, we do it. They do it, they get this great major amount. God got his attention. Jesus got his attention. Then he says, hey, leave those fish there and come follow me. Well, he didn't leave them in the ocean. He left them to the other people because he was a business. They were fishermen. There was other people that took those fish home, say, to the processing plant, right? But how did Jesus get his, their attention? By giving them more than they wanted. More than they were hunting for, more yeah. than they wanted, more than their expectation. He showed him he is the bread of life, and if you follow me, you never have to worry about fishing all night. Okay? Jesus walks on the sea. Remember the story of Jesus walking on the water? Jesus, it's called the Sea of Galilee. Jesus walks on it. How did Jesus walk on the sea? Did Jesus break the laws of physics? No. Je the Bible says angels will bear him up. So an angel had to hold Jesus up. What happened to Peter? An angel held Peter up as he walked on the sea. They didn't break the laws of physics. Otherwise, God would be a lawbreaker. God didn't stop gravity. Yes, go ahead. Oh, no, so that makes sense. Okay, so the point is the scripture. We study the scripture. Why is this important? Not because I can look at a situation that so, is so unbelievable I can't get there like walking on water versus like I'm in the ocean my ship sinks how am I gonna get to land if you know the book God has commanded angels to bear you up so that you don't even dash your foot upon a rock I totally believe if you're in a sea if you're have the faith of Christ and you're in this in this situation and you proclaim that word of God in a legal court orderly fashion that you could walk on water but it's really angels bearing you up yeah. Jesus commands the sea to be still and it was you ever command an inanimate object to do something no, yeah. this wow. inanimate, or you know, like, have you ever commanded Lake Berryessa to be calm? Yeah. And, and well, stuff I like that? Berryessa, but. but the point is, is it's not that you have command over the weather, that this sea had a being, a personality. This sea in this position was demonically inspired supernaturally inspired and it was manifested in the sea of the Galilee of the waves going up and down mm -hmm. because if the wind stopped if Jesus was causing the sea that uh, sea of Galilee the waves are caused by the wind because it's not an ocean it's a lake mm -hmm. okay so if the wind stopped immediately would the we, we waves stop immediately yeah, yeah. no they no. wouldn't it takes them some time if you have a bicycle and you push a bicycle, your kid on a bicycle, you let them go, as soon as you let go, does the bicycle stop? No, it goes for a little while. So the waves are going to go back and forth, bouncing from shore to shore, right? 
and get smaller and smaller and finally, and finally dissipate. But when Jesus commanded it, they stopped immediately. Smooth as glass. Jesus did not break the laws of physics. This was demonic activity. He broke the demon's command over the waves. Okay? Now Jesus brings a flood on the water upon the earth. A flood of water, the seas, for the destruction of all those that breathe, that have the breath of life in them. Only saving eight souls, Noah, who was the only righteous man, and his family of seven, allowing them to rise above, that should be above the, the land, or water, staying on top of the water, without touching the earth. So Noah and his family was saved because they were in an ark. But they were on top of the sea. They weren't under the sea. They weren't in the sea. They were on the sea. This angel put his foot on the sea, not in the sea. Now here's another little side note. How many righteous people were there on the earth at that time? The Bible says one. Out of millions and billions of people, possibly, there was only one righteous. You know, that word righteous is righteous genealogy. He was the only one that could trace his bloodline true back to Eve, from whom Christ would be born, the seed of Eve. Noah was. Noah was, the last one. But how about who he was married to? How about his children? They were saved because of Noah's righteousness. Because how do you, many of you know, whether you have a gender identity crisis or not, that if you're a male, you are not gonna have an offspring. You need a female to do that. Noah needed a wife and children that were both men and they had to have wives or Jesus would not have been born. There had to be offspring. So why were they saved? Because of Noah's righteousness, not their righteousness. Sometimes we're blessed because of the people we hang around with. Sometimes our children are blessed because of the parents' observance of God, not their observance of God. Sometimes your house doesn't get broke into, but your neighbors do, because the angels are around, not allowing those demon-inspired people to even come onto your property. Oh. Where do you get that? That's cool. The book. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool? You like that? Oh, yeah, because our, our mailboxes were broken into. In Except um, from 36 on down, they weren't. And I'm, 30, I'm 35. <laughs> that cool right? So you, yours were, you're saying yours I'm weren't? Saved. Yeah. yeah. You broke into my... Amen. What happened? I don't know, but I could uh -huh. believe, because I've seen this in the spirit realm, that there was an angel stop it. You can't go no further. Yeah. Stop. Awesome. This is the woman of God. And her and all these other people are going to be saved because of her. Quite possible. Maybe not, but quite possible. Yeah, I thought that was nice. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jesus, uh, the demons that entered the swine. So remember when Jesus, the whole thing about pigs and they jump in the water. Mm -hmm. So the demons that entered the swine jumped into the sea. In part of the they didn't jump into a mud puddle. They didn't jump into the river. They jumped into the sea and perished. Okay? We see that in Matthew 8, chapter 8, verse 32. And he said unto them, Jesus says unto the demons, Go and go. And when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Why would these demons want to go into the sea and not into the arid and dry places? Because God told them to. Huh? Because God told them to. 
God told God didn't tell them to. Oh, they yeah. asked who God gave them permission. Because the sea, especially in this time was written, and I believe it's true, but the Jewish mindset is the sea is where the demons were kept until the day of judgment and the wicked were held into yeah, the day of, of judgment. Oh, okay. We have transmorphosed that into hell. But you know, nobody's in hell. Satan is in hell. There ain't no demons in hell right now. They haven't been judged. Yeah, yes. The reason why they're falling out in, in the sea is because when God flooded everything, that's that's obviously that's that's where they got stuck at. I mean, well, it could be, but not. That's not because of why. But well, the sea indicates a vast number of people. Yeah. Okay. So in Revelation, he's seen a sea of glass of all these people. Okay. Uh, the sea could be a large area. But at this point in time, and especially in the early Christian era, mm -hmm. the sea was considered hell. Oh, yeah. That's why people were deadly afraid of seas, the sea. That's why sailors mm -hmm. never learned how to swim. Mm -hmm. Because they, if, if you went in the ocean, you would die. That's going to hell. Yeah. That's where all the demons and wicked people and ghosts are. Well, they showed on old maps serpents and and teeth are a fish with big teeth in the pictures of the old maps when they were you know sure. exploring mm -hmm. not sharks but creatures that yeah. demonic creatures yeah that That's nobody crazy. ever seen so that makes sense okay yeah. so when we look up that word sea is sea in the greek okay it means to be employed like a hebrew <laughs> to do what Israel is supposed to do, to do what the children of God are supposed to do, to be confined within a borders of the That's sea the between the Mediterranean and the Arabian Sea mm -hmm. as well as the river Nile and Egypt. That's where the children of Israel is supposed to be. Yeah. That's where the millennium is going to be, the temple of God is supposed to be. It's not going to be in Australia. Much more room there. It's a much bigger continent, right? It is a that sea can mean a geographical area with borders. Yeah. Okay, which it meant right there. Now also, sea in Hebrew. So Old Testament, like they flooded the sea. It's a large body of water, but it's also a direction. What direction is it? West. Jesus comes from the east. Demons come from the west. Your sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. Is the east ever separated from the west? If you walk east, you will always walk east and walk around the earth. If you walk west, you will always walk around west and walk the earth. They're never separated. So it's not talking about that. It's talking about from whence godly angels come from, God comes and from whence demons come. Mm -hmm. God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Jesus is coming from the east gate. Jesus will enter into the east gate. The west gate is always representing uh, hell, demon, th thresh, the, the, where you, refuge, where you pour out the refuge. Where was Guyana, the burning pit, where they put the west of Jerusalem, not east, okay? A lot of analogy, but how about the earth? So the angels standing one foot on the sea and one foot on the earth. It's the inhabited earth, the abode of in animals of men. So if you're this big Megatron, giant, 20-store high angel, and your foot standing in the ocean, mm -hmm. let's say that ocean is 2,000 foot deep. Yeah. Where's this, the foot of the angel? Yeah. On the ocean floor, right? What's that called? The earth? Yeah. That's why it's better translated the land. What's on land? The place where animals and inhabitants that have the breath of life live in them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Lizards don't live in the water. Dogs don't live in the water. 
who lives in the water? Fish do. Fish. The fish don't have the breath of life in them. Really? No. According to the word of God, no. Okay, so that's another thing. Is So um, what we see is the angel is having his foot on, not down. He's not touching the earth, so he's level. He's not doing hip displacement, right? He's level. One is upon the sea, and the sea is supporting. One's upon the earth, which is the dry land, and it is supporting. One are those held de de demons and wicked people that have been held for punishment, and the other is those that are still alive. What's that mean? Whatever he's saying or doing in this book, whatever he's going to proclaim, there's no place for you to hide. What if you were dead? What if you were... God's pouring his wrath out on people that have persecuted Christians. We read that in earlier Revelation where the saint says, How long, O Lord, until you avenge the blood of the saints of those who were killed, beheaded, eaten, crucified, mm -hmm. fed to lions? How long? And God says, Wait a little while until the rest. Okay? Die like you died. So God's going to pour his wrath out in these end times. It's going to be terrible, right? But what if you died 500 years ago? Are you going to go through that wrath? It would seem not. That would seem unfair. It would seem unfair that God would punish these groups of people worse than Genghis Khan. Worse than Babylon. Bur you right? You understand what I'm saying? But this angel is saying, no, the wrath of God is going to go into the sea. And those that are dead and those that have been fighting against God, those that are the rebellions of God are going to get this wrath. The final, not before, not the other six trumpets, but when the second, seventh trumpet, it's going to get everybody. Everybody. If you've been dead for 2,000 years, I'm sorry, you're not escaping the wrath of God. It's not for the final day of judgment because what happens at the final day of judgment? You get thrown in the lake of fire with the devil and die. You're perished. You're destroyed. Why is that important? Because God's a just God. I've always wondered, God, how come these people are suffering who haven't done all these terrible atrocities? They're deceived. They're worshiping Satan. Yeah, they don't love you. Yeah, I get that. But did how about Hitler? Does Hitler get a you know get out of jail, escape free from the wrath of God? Charles Manson. How about Charles Manson? How about all these other people? Okay, so Earth strong can also mean the Earth, uh, the land of the living. So we got dry land where animals live, those that have the life, a breath of life in it, and the land of the living. So it's not the land of the dead. Where are those that are died? In this time, the idioms, the Jews believed they were in the ocean. Okay? Um, which now brings this whole another issue of the story of the bosom of Abraham whether that was true or accurate, which I believe was a parable, not a true thing that there isn't a bosom of Abraham. Many, many issues of uh, why that's not possible. Now, in times past, the sea was believed to be the holding place of the wicked that died until judgment. Therefore, the statement that this mighty angel put one foot on the sea is the imagery of putting his foot on the neck of his enemies. Second Peter chapter two, verse four, or two through four. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell, the abyss, the sea, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. I've been a scuba diver. I've been in the ocean. You know, the ocean is mostly dark. The sun does travel. But it only really, you see all these pristine places, the go ocean, where you could see really long. Those are in bad oceans. Those are in, in, in 
dying oceans. Those are in oceans that don't have a good food supply. Mm -hmm. What do you got in an ocean that has good food supply? You can hardly see in front of your face. You got a three or four foot uh, thing because there's so many shrimp, creole, stuff floating around. You just can't see. Mm -hmm. And there's teeming wildlife everywhere. But you go to the Bahamas, you yeah. go to these other places where there's hardly anything. You see, oh, wait, I get to see all these fish. Yeah. No, you just get to see a, a remnant of the fish compared to what's in Monterey Bay. But there's nothing to hide them. There's no foliage. There's no kelp. There's nothing to hide these fish. They got coral to run to. And they swim over, well, they swim over sand. See, this is, the sea is a place of the deep, the dark held in, in, in what Peter was referring to, in this analogy, okay? Um, where to put one's foot on the earth is putting his foot over those that remain on the earth. God's going to have, you're going to be judged. Well, how about these people that remain on earth that think they're following God? Are they going to suffer the wrath of God? Absolutely. Beware of false prophets. Does that mean they're prophets? Yes, but they're false prophets. Not that they're not prophesying the word of God, but they're not filled with the spirit of God. Yeah. Okay, they could be sound telling you lie, but then they wouldn't be prophets, they would be liars. Mm -hmm. Okay, the word prophet means one that says the word of God. Okay, what was the man that spoke to a, don a donkey, a prophet? Oh man. Anyway, he was a false prophet, but he spoke the word of God. Balaam, he spoke the word of God correctly, but he was considered a false prophet while he was speaking the word of God correctly. Okay, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So he, yes? He was talking about God, he don't have the spirit of God, like he didn't have a good heart. Or... Balaam was a worshiper of Satan. He was a practicer of divination. He talked to animals. He was like the horse whisperer. That's why he was able to talk to his, de his, his donkey. Okay, but God, but these other false teachers listened to him because he was the man. So God used him to speak to these other kings, not because he was a righteous man. And we're told in the New Testament that Balaam, Balaam only did it for money. There was nothing good about Balaam, but he spoke the word of God accurately. He said, I can't say anything but what God has commanded me to say. That didn't make him holy and righteous. He's not going to heaven because he spoke the word of God correctly, without error. He's going to hell, his place, because his father was the devil. Not everyone that saith to me, now this is in verse 21, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, have we not prophesied in your name? Wow, that's a Balaam. Hey, I don't want to go in the lake of fire. Didn't I prophesy in your name? Mm -hmm. Hmm. And in thy name cast out devils? The word of God talks about the seven sons of Sheba that went out casting devils. And the devils looked at him and said, Peter, I know. James, I know. Somebody of uh, something like that. Some of the apostles, and I know, but who are you? And they leaped upon him and beat him up. And he went away naked. Wow. So there was people that cast out demons. And they did it in the name of the God of the apostles. It wasn't their God. But they needed did it in the name of Jesus. And in thy name, uh, and in thy name done many wonderful works. How many people have done like we've done? Feed the homeless. A lot. But they're going to go to hell. Because they did it for their own selfish ambition. How many people preach the gospel that are going to go to hell because they're like Paul? Say, some preach it out of envy. Some preach it because they want to, or out of greed, they want to make money. But they're going to hell. 
But some preach it because they have, God has called them. They have an earnest desire for the loss to be found. Okay, um, thus there will be no place to hide from the wrath of God, even those who have been dead for thousands of years. In my mind, this is why the angel, the mighty angel, has one foot on the sea and one foot on the earth, so that I know God is just and nobody's escaping it. Cain, who died a long time ago, is not escaping the wrath of God just because he's dead. Okay? Now that John hears the seven thunders that is about to happen to, to all in the sea and on the land, he is commanded not to record it. This indicates John had something to write with and on which might be the little book held by the angel. Nevertheless, he is commanded not to do so, which I believe was to stop Satan from acquiring knowledge to foil God's plans he has for the wicked. You know, no one knows when this final day is coming. Why? Because the book hasn't been closed. It hasn't been written. We don't know. There is not a specific time and date when the last person whose name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be born and given the chance. He may not be able to be born for hundreds of years without anybody else. I mean, there might be a time period where no one on earth's name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But this one guy hadn't done. Because it wasn't the best time in time for that man to grow up out after Jesus. Gee, God is not going to allow anyone that comes against you. If you're in Christ Jesus, God will avenge er against everyone who's hurt you in any way, shape, or form. That means even saying a bad thing about you. That means even talking behind your back so that you don't get that promotion. God will avenge them and they will suffer the full wrath of God. There's no place for them to hide. So as I mentioned to you before, when I would go minister in, in, to those behind bars, God would show me the people's names, the faces, and what they would say that they would come. And, and and that was all cool. That was great. I'd go there. I'd see him, and I just have this. I would have this boldness to say and tell them what God had said, and it'd be true, and it'd be words of wisdom. And they'd fall on their face, and they'd give their life over to God. But then, all of a sudden, those people God showed me who weren't gonna were come were to come, weren't coming anymore. So I would say, God would tell me, Hey, Edward, coming. And I said, well, where's Edward? And they go, man, he just got in a fight yesterday. This morning, 15 minutes before, he got put in a hole. Satan knew the plans and then tried to foil them. Why did Paul, John, told not to write what was written in the book? To keep us from stumbling or falling? Or to keep Satan from coming fighting against you? The plans that he has. It's much better to win a war if your adversary doesn't know what you're doing. Amen. Lord bless you. Lord keep you. And uh, I hope everybody is blessed. And as you can see how long it takes just to do the simple things of God in reading it. So you don't come up with some weird crazy <laughs> notion. Okay. God is good all the time to Praise his inheritance.